Welcome, my name is Marty Heslin, and we're going to talk about the economics of healthcare. I am a uh, professor of surgery at the University of Alabama in Birmingham and the uh, chief of the medical staff. I got interested in uh, the economics of healthcare after I did a master's in health administration at UAB. Today, what we're going to understand is the recent history of physician compensation in the U.S., and then a little bit about how the payers have responded and specifically CMS. We're going to talk a little bit about Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015, better known as MACRA, and how it's going to affect us and what it meant for replacing the sustainable growth rate. And then lastly, we're going to talk about some payment methodologies that's coming down the road and really try to understand how it's going to affect us, but more importantly, how can we respond so we can be successful? So the first thing we're going to talk about is the recent past and the CMS response. The recent history of physician compensation in the U.S. is such that the physician submitted a bill to CMS who paid usual, customary, and reasonable payments to the physicians as a fee for service. This resulted in an enormous windfall for most physicians and significantly increased the overall compensation of us as a group. In the late 80s and the early 90s, CMS, other payers decided that physicians may be overcompensated and had concerns about the quality of care that was being delivered. In 1997, Congress created and Bill Clinton signed into law something called the sustainable growth rate. You as a physician heard this from the AMA and all the other organizations as something that needed to go away because a doc fix needed to be put into place. The way the sustainable growth rate worked was that it set physician expenses or payments based on a target. That target was the uh, GDP. If we were over target, there was a conversion factor that lowered physician compensation. And what happened was is that we were able to, we were obviously over target as we were taking care of more people and if that sustainable growth rate had been followed, the current physician population would have been paid 21% less. Now, that was a big deal. And since healthcare is legislated, all the legislators got together and said, you know, we can't do this because physicians are their constituents. And so what happened was every six months or every eight months, there was a doc fix. And that meant that they went in and created a patch on it and just said, all right, we're going to kick the can down the road. We're not going to fix this right now. And we're just going to deal with it and keep paying the docs about what we were getting. So what, what are the economics of that? How does that work? So if a provider is being paid to do a job, that's piecework. So me, a surgeon, I do X number of surgeries per week. And we're paid fee for service. And then the payer comes in and says, you know what, we're going to pay you less. For every operation that you do, we're going to pay you less. What is the modification of human behavior, physician or not? The change in human behavior is that you do more of that service to preserve or increase your compensation. It's just the normal way to do it. So we try to fit in more things. And to some degree, that's what the American public wants. The American public wants a doctor that's going to take care of them now in a timely fashion because we're not used to waiting. We're not used to being in line. And so physicians performed more. Patients said, it's okay, I want it done tomorrow. But the government was concerned. And they felt that they needed to ensure that physicians were providing necessary and high quality and timely medical care such that high volume and high compensation is not the primary goal. Surgeons and their offices are effectively communicating with patients and families in a timely fashion so that it isn't just about doing the procedure, but it's talking to them and helping them understand the risks and benefits. And that surgeons are involved in the care that's mandated across a episode of care so that a uh, global period. So what happens is, is if I operate on a patient, truth be told, I'm responsible for the pre, intra, and post-operative care. 
But what happened was is that consultants were involved for every basic thing. So that if someone has a little bit of anemia, they'd call a hematologist. If they had some diabetes, well, gosh, I couldn't manage that. We need to call an endocrinologist. And all of a sudden, there were 10 different doctors taking care of one patient around a relatively uh, straightforward operation. So the government had concerns about that saying, well, for basic medical care, maybe you need to be involved with that as opposed to consulting on all of this. So why is the future predictable for changes in the economics of medical care? Uh, why do we have a pretty good idea that this is going to happen? Many of us want it to just go away. And we think if we hold out long enough, it's just not going to happen. But the truth is the government can print all the money that it needs at least up until this point, we've been pretty good at that. Um, the, we can support a program with deficit spending. The government has time on its side. I'm a short timer. You know, my career, my effective career from the time I start until the time I finish is maybe 30 years. Well, the government can start a program and say it's X number of things need to be done by Y date. There's a protest out there. The legislator gets involved and they say, all right, fine, we'll delay it a year. That's okay. They're going to manage it. There's a new population of doctors coming through. They're going to manage the expectations differently. And then suddenly things are going to change. The other thing is that entitlement programs like the ACA are generally supported by the public. There are a lot of people that get subsidies for that. And there's probably little concern for cuts to provider and hospital compensation. Lastly, the business community does not want to continue pay for the high cost of health care. How has the business community responded to that? Offshore. If you can have a factory in another country that manages your business without having to pay for the high cost of American health care, the economics say we're going to go there because we are involved in global trade right now. Like it or not, that is the, that's the model for the business community. They would love to be here. They don't have to deal with transportation. They don't have to deal with shipping. But the high cost of health care makes it much more economically sound to work someplace else. So the conclusion is this is not going away. When I was preparing for this talk, I went back and looked in uh, 2007 when I got involved in the chief of staff's office. And we really tried to understand um, you know, what was happening to CMS. Everybody was trying to predict it, what's going to happen, how's our practice going to change. And I found a slide from 2007. Now that is a long time ago. But you know what was extremely telling? That slide is true for everything we predicted was going to happen, actually happened. Because the government has got a program, they have a plan. This is not willy-nilly. This is along a clear path. And what we looked at then was, we said, all right, business as usual. We're taking care of patients. This is the way we do it. And the government said, you know what? I really want to make sure that we're getting value for what we're paying for. And we responded by business as usual. So we did the same thing. And the government said, you know what? That's not good enough. We're going to create a website. We're going to pay you to be voluntarily involved. And then, oh, by the way, Voluntary involvement is going to stop, and you're actually going to be penalized if you don't participate. And yes, we're going to publish your results on the website, and we're going to slowly just start to introduce the concept that we have certain things that you, you the medical community, have gone ahead and said, this is important. But because for whatever reason, it hasn't been introduced generally in practice, we're going to help you. Knock, knock, the government's here to help. I'm the government and I'm here to help. Okay, we're going to help you understand how to take care of patients better and make those processes better. So what happened was is they created the Hospital Compare website. You did hospitals to begin with, but ultimately it'll be people's names. So what are the catalysts for change? If we sum that all up, you have unsustainable cost growth. We have a huge variation in the services that are delivered when you look at the outcomes based on somewhat questionable risk adjustment. But bottom line is, is that if we risk adjust everybody the same, we have still have high variation in the way the outcomes of the patients that we take care of. We have data that demonstrates that there are significant gaps in the delivery of ideal care. And what does that mean? It means that 
the health economists see this, we got to find a way to pay people differently, to incentivize them to be involved in the total care of the patient. How we do that so that the, uh, you know, and, and the truth is at the end of the day, we have a patient that have illnesses that not, they're not going away. You need someone to take care of them and you need someone to organize them, the administrative people. We're all gonna have to work together to make this a better system. So what is the current model? Current model is resource consumption and quantity. So we have a passive payer. They just say, all right, fine, we'll give you money. You do whatever you want. The future model is integration of quality and the payment system so that the hospital, the home health, the physician, all the different care providers are linked together so that we deliver a model that's in some respects easy for the patient to, to manage. And then lastly, the quality of care is paramount and the unnecessary costs are avoided. How do we get people invested in the process of saying, just even understanding of what something costs? Now, we didn't go to medical school to do all this. We didn't go to medical school to learn how to code. We didn't learn to do billing. We didn't learn to be part of the cost of things. But this is what's changing. And to some degree, we have to be engaged in the process because like my old boss used to say, if we don't do it, if we're not involved, somebody else is going to do it for us government. And no one's going to be happy. The patients aren't going to be happy. The doctors are going to be happy. And the government ultimately may not be happy by that. So that's something we need to be involved with. So how do we define what's going to be measured? When you look at it, the government went back and, and I went back and said, all right, let's look at the things that people are using now. In 2003, they came up with the Surgical Care Improvement Project or SCIP. It was called SIP before that, but it's called SKIP, and it promoted evidence-based medicine. That's what I was talking about earlier, where we came back and said, you know what, we need an opportunity to have certain processes that you all, you physicians, went ahead and had published, say, the data supports use of this, but you haven't really implemented it. Well, we're going to help you implement that, and we're going to measure these individual things, and then we're going to tell you how you do. And then they came up with patient safety indicators, and that allows for evaluation of the care in hospitals and how we provide those measures for improvement. We came up with hospital-acquired conditions. The government said, you know what? And they used to be called never events. These things should never happen. You know, you shouldn't leave sponges in. You really shouldn't get pressure sores on people. You really shouldn't have a central line infection. And the people who, the providers, the physicians say, well, some of that is unavoidable, well, you know what, some of it's probably, uh, we probably really shouldn't ever have that. We can quibble about each of the individual things, but the bottom line is, this is what the government sees as the never things that should never happen in a hospital. They're the ones paying the bill, and so ultimately we have to be part of that. 2006, they came up with the Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems, and no one remembers that but they remember all these caps. You have H caps and CG caps, and then they're gonna come out with outpatient surgery caps. And the reality is, it's just a way for the government to measure how the patient, the, you know, the consumer feels they're being treated. It's really a patient experience thing. So that you can't be mean to everybody. You say, listen, you need an operation, and I'm gonna be mean to you, and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's bad for patient experience. Well, you know, if you're, it's a, to some degree, physicians feel like they're being squeezed, and we get that. We understand that all of you out there feel like you're being squeezed, and I, and I have to say it's like one run-on sentence when we think about all this regulation and oversight. You want me to uh, operate at the 75th percentile uh, for efficiency. You want me to be really cheap in what I use. You want me to show up for 15 minutes of my appointment with a smile on my face telling you that it's all good news. Well, somewhere in there it has to give a little bit, but the way the government sees it is we can measure you against yourselves. It's compared to a percentile across the country and see where you fit in. They're going to incentivize for people that are above the median. They're going to penalize for people below the median. So when you look at the implementation of this program, and this is a slide that looks at value-based purchasing by year. 
And I went back and I started this process in 2012, educating the physicians at UAB. And at, back then, it was simply looking at patient experience and the processes that we do. Well, do you give antibiotics on time? Not that you're giving the appropriate one, but ultimately the appropriate one was included. But do you give them on time? Do you stop them on time? Things like that. And everybody quibbled and said, oh, that doesn't matter because we really need outcomes. Well, guess what? The government believes in that as well. And over time, in 2014, it became outcomes, experience, and process. Well, in 2015, now it's dollars per Medicare beneficiary spent, outcomes, experience, and process. And over time, what's happening is the outcomes is becoming more important, the process is becoming less important, and the experience and the dollars per Medicare beneficiary are going up. So we are being measured on things that we think are ultimately important. We're going to quibble about risk adjustment because that is always, you know, your patients are not as sick as my patients. I have the sickest patients in the hospital. All right, we've heard that. I don't believe the data. Okay, we've heard that. We understand all that, but the bottom line is that this is the process by which um, it's happening. We need to get understand it. We need to understand the rules by which we're being measured, and then we need to participate in the process. So one more thing I'd like to mention about this slide that's really important. The data collection period for 2015 has already happened. The data collection for 2016 is now. So if you haven't started worrying about the process, patient experience, the outcomes or your patient safety indicators, and the efficiency or dollars per Medicare beneficiary spent, you're already behind. So you need to make sure that these things are important in your hospital, they're important in your practice, and we are already being measured for it. I think that the government is encouraging collaboration. And I'll talk a little bit about the stick, and we'll talk a little bit about the carrot. Now the stick is that the government put out a uh, transmittal, a CMS transmittal 541, which is, doesn't mean anything to you, but it means that claims that are related stay together so that the hospital and the physician are linked. In the past, the penalty has primarily been to the hospital, and that's because the majority of the money goes to the hospital. There was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2006 that really looked at the cost associated with operations of hips and knees, spine, colon, and heart surgery. And what that study showed was that 85% of the total payment around an episode of care went to the hospital. And so the government said, well, listen, we're just going to focus on hospital penalties. And what they realized was that actually the physician drives a lot of the cost on what they order. So what they did was go ahead and link those two together. And when, so when the hospital gets penalized, the physician also can be penalized for not providing appropriate documentation or whatever else the government is looking for. And then the docs say, well, how are they ever going to figure that out? They created something called the recovery audit contractors. And these people are here to really go through the records and find out when we were appropriately compliant. And they're going to link together the hospital and the doc. So it does have the potential to affect professional compensation. Now, what's the carrot? The carrot came out uh, with something called gain sharing. And that stems from a previous, there are a couple of different rules and laws there's something called the anti-kickback statute. There's something called, which is just what it sounds. There is something called Stark laws where you can't refer to yourself. There are all these things that say, all right, you guys have figured out to be profitable and we don't allow any of that stuff. Gain sharing focuses on the expense side of the equation and says, you know what? We would like you to be involved with the process of saving money. And so in any payment model, and this is where it's important as docs where you can be involved, and especially surgeons, because we spend a lot of money in the operating room on all this different equipment, capitation, bundled payments, DRGs, fee-for-service, it doesn't matter. In every different payment model, if you can reduce expenses, if you can open only five pieces of mesh and throw four on the floor, if you can actually save and maybe use something cheaper, use a few less electrical devices in every operation so that you don't op open every piece of equipment for every operation every day, you stand to benefit because that goes right to the bottom line of the hospital. 
Gain sharing laws are relaxed to encourage collaboration, but you have to meet a couple criteria that it must be voluntary. You can't be forced into it. You provide relevant information to the individual physician, so I know how I do. The incentive programs must recognize that there are variations in care so that it has to be risk adjusted to some degree because I don't want to be having the guy who takes care of the sickest patients suddenly find out, well, golly, I'm spending more money and I'm being penalized. Lastly, it has to be a, um, you have to incentivize for improvement, but you also have to incentivize for great performance. Because you could see that somebody's that's working really hard and skimping, they'd get no incentive, yet the person whose baseline is really expensive and they make a big improvement, well, the guy over here is saying, man, I've been skimping for years, saving money. This guy's getting all the money. So that's not going to work. So you need to pay for both good performance, reward the people that are doing a good job, but also reward the people that are going to improve. It really is a great idea. And I think that uh, focusing on the expense side from a surgical practice, and we'll get to this at the end on how you can um, how you can help and how you can be successful. But if you can remember this one piece of information, reducing your expenses and making sure that the people you work with know that and report that and get it back to you, it's a really great opportunity. So the last piece we're going to talk about in this section is really how uh, you're going to be managed. And there's something called the PQRS, and most of you have probably already been signed up for it, and if you haven't, your practice plan already has. And it provides information on the quality of care. It began in 2006. It was made permanent in 2008. I guarantee you everybody who's been practicing in 2006 and 2008 had no idea about it. But the bottom line is, is that the government is using this to incentivize payments for reporting in 2013, 2014, and there will be increasing penalties. So you're incentivized, standard government practice. You're incentivized to participate until X period of time, at which point you're penalized for not participating. And what the government has done, they recognize that it's harder for smaller groups. There will be a little bit of a uh, uh, delay in small groups, less than 25 practitioners, 25 to 99 will have come in an X period of time and practices greater than 100, they're gonna have uh, increasing numbers of uh, measures reported. This is a busy slide and I'm not gonna talk about it other than to say that the penalty amounts differ based on the group size, whether they're successful in the participation in the PQRS process, and then meaningful use of the medical record. What is meaningful use? It's the first time I brought this up, but it means that if the government paid you all, which they did at $44,000 per practitioner, if you participated early on to develop these systems, if we're gonna provide money for an electronic health record, you guys need to participate in it. Now we can quibble about whether it's you know writing X number of prescriptions or making sure the history and physicals in the HMP, but the bottom line is they want you to use the medical record, the electronic health record, because ultimately we believe it's greater safety for the patient and greater information transfer for seeing consultants and things like that. Thank you for watching part one.